Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This evening, I am delighted to welcome Professor Connor Gassan, Academic Director for Research in the School of Sport, Health and Applied Science at St. Mary's University. And we're here for Connor's inaugural lecture. I'm also delighted to welcome Connor's wife, Claire, and his mother, Catherine, who have joined us here this <coughs> evening and are duly proud of all of Connor's achievements, which we will celebrate here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Connor began his career at the West London Institute of Higher Education. Whilst there, he began investigating the epidemiology of sport-related injury, initially in rugby league. But to prepare him for the West London Institute of Higher Education, he did his initial studies here at St Mary's. And that's why we are particularly pleased to be able to welcome him back here this evening. Connor, since that time at the West London Institute, has undertaken a number of research collaborations with <coughs> renowned institutions, including Trinity College Dublin, University College Dublin, and the Irish Rugby Football Union, amongst many others. Having returned to St Mary's as a staff member in 2001, as a visiting lecturer whilst completing his PhD at Brunel University, Connor then became a senior lecturer in 2006 and reader in 2010. Connor began his latest position as academic director for research in September 2016 and also serves as chair of the university's ethics committee. Connor's research has been published extensively in renowned journals covering sports injury and rehabilitation and he is making a major contribution to raising the profile of concussion and head injuries in sport in his work with the International Concussion and Head Injury Research Foundation. Connor's school, Shaz, is internationally recognised for excellence in research and progressing academic thought. The sports sciences are making real changes to sport at all levels. They are improving performances and streamlining training programmes, helping athletes find that extra 1% to succeed. They are also changing our understanding of the role nutrition, teaching athletes how to fuel themselves for peak performance. And as we, all hear, and as we will hear from Connor, they are reforming responses and treatments for sports injuries and understanding how sport can be made safer for everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, I am honoured that at St Mary's our sports science research under Connor's directorship is contributing to this global discussion. Connor, we are very proud of all of your achievements and join you this evening with your family to celebrate your inaugural lecture. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Professor Connor. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm probably just going to rattle on about what I've done for about the last 30 years and robbed the living off the univer various universities. So we'll take it from there. Um, my first time I got involved in research um, was while I was here at St Mary's. It was, yeah. It was, right, we were in the third year, there were two of us, there was myself and my good friend Gareth, who I'm very pleased to say is here this evening, and we were supervised by Angela, a come in, who used to work here, um, and we did sort of various projects. It wasn't compulsory back then, um, there were just a few avid people who wanted to do them, and myself and Gareth were two of those. Angela was there, she's very fond of telling us that she supervised us in between getting us out of trouble, which is probably very true. Um, but we did it. There wasn't that many people who did it, as I said, but we did well enough that Angela volunteered us, stroke, said, would you like to go and present your work somewhere? So we said, yeah. And we arranged to sort of go to a conference, a student conference at Carnegie in Leeds. 
The only problem with that was it just happened to be that we had to be there. It was on the morning after the day we left university. And we've all left university before, and you know what you spend the day doing. So myself and Gareth rocked up and got the milk train out of <coughs> King's Cross at some time, silly o'clock at night, I think it was about 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. We were picked up at the station, um, and in those days, you didn't type your overheads, you wrote them out by hand. Um, so at three in the morning or whatever it was, we wrote our overheads out by hand. So not a lot of sleep there. Um, we must have done something right, because we, we both decided to carry on researching. Um, Gareth is now head of department at Swansea University, and um, I haven't done that bad if Francis says all those nice things about me. Um, it was. We, we did. We enjoyed it, and we got stuck into it. From there, I went on to Purdue University and did my master's degree, and then I went and got a job at the West London Institute. Um, I wasn't really sure. I, was, I indulged in a few research projects back then. Um, <laughs> I began to learn a bit about computer programming, but there was nothing that I was all that serious about. I did some sort of learning software for physiotherapy training and some research method stuff. But I'd like to take you forward to June 1990. Um, the lady up there is my good friend, Dee Jennings. Uh, he was sitting in the audience tonight and, um, well, I'll tell you the story and I don't think I would have got anywhere near it like as far without this. Um, I was on the coaching staff at F Fulham Rugby League Club, as it was then, um, for you youngsters, that's now London Broncos. Um, and it's had about three different names in between. And I was on the coaching staff and we got a new doctor who was D, and she just, and I hope I've got this right, she just passed her apothecary certificate in sports medicine. Is that the one? And it was done at St. Bart's Hospital. It was, am I right in saying it's one of the first ones, first sports medicine certificates? And she came along and she was very enthusiastic and wanted to involve, she'd done some rugby union before, but she wanted to be involved in the rugby league club. Um, what happened was, I think, sort of, we were introduced by the head coach, a guy called Ross Strubwick, um, and I've got to thank him for sort of the, putting us in the same spot so we had to talk to each other. DR, DR and said, can you get me some, re like some of the latest research on rugby league? And I said, yeah, not a problem. Um, I went to find it, and it was all about five years old, probably, and some of the other stuff older than that. Um, and somewhere in the conversation after we had this, we decided, well, if we haven't got it and there isn't research out there, then we should do our own. Right? It lasted. I think the first paper came out in about 1993, right? um, and the last one came out in about 2012. Right? There were, I think, about 21 of them. I kept losing count. Um, but. It was a very, very fruitful relationship, um, which sort of pays dividends. It, we couldn't really, I don't think, it, it, was, it was symbiotic in a lot of ways. We couldn't have done it without each other. Um, you have to be a medical professional to diagnose a sports injury by definition. Um, and all that other stuff about the writing and accounting <coughs> is stuff I could do quite well. So it worked very well indeed. Dee maintained that register for 13 years. And, well, without that, I wouldn't be standing here today. Also, maintaining that register um, allowed us to address research problems that they present themselves. Um, for example, um, the ability to document injury risk when rugby league moved from the winter to the summer. Uh, at some point in 19... 96, or well, they decided about 1995, they decided they were going to play it in the summer months and it was going to be a better game and a better spectacle. It, it was, but you can't, set, you can't set experiments up to do that. If you're not there collecting the data in the first place, you're just going to miss it. We were fortunate that we were there and we were doing it. Um, we were told also it's going to be a safer game in the summer. That's not what we found. We found the injury risk basically doubled, which was fairly scary at the time, but we sort of we, learnt, we live and we learn. 
We've also got things like we were the first to ever report on academy level rugby, rugby league injuries. Uh, we also looked at it from a health and safety perspective, which gave us um, won us the SO Prize from the Society of Occupational Medicine in 2004. I might get used to this by the end. Um, adding additional studies was also incredibly easy, we found it. Once we started this, if we got over the barrier of doing it in the first place, it was quite easy to actually um, attempt things and actually bring them home. Um, one medical and performance issue that was always a problem, right, when they moved it to summer, um, it had been played in the winter and people played in the snow and the rain and things like that, and then all of a sudden they were getting asked to play in temperatures of about 25, 26, 27 degrees, sometimes even higher. Um, it was a real problem. Um, in that sort of, are players hydrated, are they dehydrated, all right, and how's it going to affect everything? Um, at the beginning, it sort of wasn't so much of a problem. In the early years of Super League, oh, I must add to that, they also decided they were going to sort of move some of the, the amateur competitions as well, so right to the summer at the same time. And there wasn't really any guidance on how to do it. So all they did was they just let people come on with water whenever they felt like it. All right. um, but it doesn't take much on that to sort of change it, because then they start running on. And, well, winning is important, as John Charlie was, tell Charlie was telling me earlier today. Um, it's the most important thing of all. So players, people were running on with water and they were doing things like coaching for coaching and a lot of other things and stuff like that. And the rugby league got, got, was, got savvy to this. Um, it did take them about two and a half years, in all honesty. Um, but they sort of they want they wanted to do the rugby the control of referees wanted to stop people running onto the pitch. Um, that wasn't good enough. We belonged to an organisation called the Rugby League Medical Association, and we had a good long. There was a meeting. I can't remember where it was, but we had a meeting, and one of the subjects that was discussed was, right, what can they do about this? So the guy who was the chairman of it was a gentleman called Chris Rag. And he went back to the rugby league to protest about this change that he wanted to make, um, and the problem. That, right, and he pointed out. And as part of that, he took with him. He took there was an article that we produced that was showing that players were losing somewhere between two and a half and three percent of body weight, which is getting to the, to the point where it's dangerous. Um, and we must remember that this, was, this was when people were allowed to sort of free access to water whenever they could get it, and they were still getting de dehydrated by very large amounts. So he, so, so Chris Rag went with, a, which effectively turned out to be a risk assessment, and as a result of that, what we got was, all right, there was a thing, there was a thing, and it's still in the rugby league bylaws called the hot weather code. And the way this works is, uh, if you're at amateur level, the referee will ju just stop the game after 20 minutes. If they decide it's hot enough, they'll get together and have a chat about it, and they'll just stop the game right in the middle of it. It is written in the rugby league bylaws. Um, it's very unnerving. You get thing. You also got things in there like you used to get a guy. You you get a referee told would tell somebody who's an academy team that said that your, that your side's going to knock the ball on after 20 minutes. Right? Um, and they were like, and they look very strange at you, like they're going to do, he's going to do something to you, but all he wanted to do was just get the break in the game so he get the water in there. It is more important to have healthy players than anything else. Okay, so, and this was there, and it's been there all the way through, um, and it's still there, and the last time I looked, it was in about 2012, right, it's still in there. They still take this very seriously as a result of some research that was done right, by us, by D, by our son, Simon. Um, from there, so we've moved on. The research skills I've learnt, right, and there was back in the days where we didn't have the internet to begin with. Right, I am that old. Um, you had to go and hunt them out. So I had to go and find books that told me how to do certain things. 
they were a lot fewer and a lot further between, but any skills I learnt right, were very easy to transfer to other sports. I did that um, with a number of things. Right? The first one I've got up there is a lady on the far side from Trinity College, Dublin. Um, her name is Fiona Wilson, and she invited me to be involved in a, in a study involving Gaelic football. Um, it was interesting. Um, I did all the analysis on it, and for whatever reason, I ended up decide, saying to Fiona, can I write this thing? So I wrote the article, right, and then I had this idea inside my head that it wasn't much use if it was written and it came out of a university in London. It would be much better if it came out of a university in Ireland. So I, sent it, I put my name and the last author on it, and I sent it back. And I was very, very pleased with that. Um, the only mistake that was on, that it got accepted, it got accepted first time round, simply because it says up there, the only mistake they could find it was me spelling Leinster wrong. Right? And I'm on, on it, I don't know if I've spelt it right today, that could be wrong. Um, but that's what it's like. I'm very, very pleased, pleased with that one. Um, that moved on, and the lady in this bottom corner here is a lady called Catherine Blake, who's at UCD. Right, there doesn't seem to be a rivalry between the two universities. They quite happily work together, and I got involved with um, with Catherine Blake, who just received some money right, from the GAA for a very big study, which is still, I think it finished last year, but it collected data for a number of years. Um, it provided many opportunities. That relationship allowed me to produce um, in conjunction with them, another 11 articles. Um, I got my first PhD student on the back of that, a lady called Edwina O'Malley, who has since graduated and I hope is off somewhere in gainful employment. And there's that, the gentleman on the far side of the bottom over there is a guy, he's a current PhD student on that project, there's a guy called Mark Rowe, who um, I believe he was a student here once upon a time, and wasn't he your tenant, JP, or something like that? Was JP here? Right, he was, he was JP's drink, JP's not here, then he was JP's drinking buddy for about a year while he was studying. <laughs> Went off that. There were, I never stray very far from the rugby league. I think it's sort of, it's my sport, I'm into it. Um, we got together, this was a very curious relationship. We had three people there, Lisa Hodgson, who's here this evening, Doug King, who's a Kiwi, and I do hope, right, there's a picture of the guy down there who I think is Tim Gabbert, but noddy, Jamie's nodding his head. I wasn't sure, because I've never met the guy. <laughs> However, I'll tell you a bit more. Um, originally, it was, right, and we decided to sort of put a paper together, it was about a consensus paper on what should be collected when we were doing a, a, rug, a study in rugby league. At the time, it was very fashionable. They did them in football, they did them in rugby, they did them in tennis, they did them in lots of different things. Um, I suppose we just jumped on the bandwagon, really, on that one. Um, originally, there were six of us, and we had a row about what constitutes the definition of an injury. So two of them dropped out. Um, there you go. Things to fight over. The definition of injury. It's got to rank as one of the silliest ever. But now, right, four of us sat together and we did the work and we completed this work on what it should be and what we thought you should collect. And um, we also did another paper, right, which was on the influence that the definition of injury had and what it looked like, what it did to your actually injury rates at the end. Um, both of these papers, I've got to say, um, Right, as I said, I've never met Tim Gabbard. We did it all by email, right? Lisa and I could talk on the phone because Lisa was up in Yorkshire at the time. I was in London. Um, and I've never met Tim to this day. And Doug, first time I met him was October last year. And this was all going on about a good eight, ten years ago. Everything had to be done by email. That was the method of communication. However, it was very fruitful. Um, I still research with both Doug and Lisa, and I hope one day to actually meet Tim Gabbert. Um, right, when I was putting this together, um, Ross Wadey said, he said, I want to see plenty of fluffy, qualitative research in this. 
right? And this is the best I can imagine. Uh, apart from writing methods papers, right, I actually proposed an injury model once upon a time. Uh, and this is as fluffy as it gets. And then Ross sent me an email this morning saying he couldn't make it. He said something about Phoebe not being very well. Right? And I'm going to point out that that's his daughter and not his PhD student. Right? But that's what he said. Right? As an epidemiologist, I like numbers. Right? I like statistics, things like that. But we put this together. Um, what this did do, thinking back about it, and I probably haven't thought about it in a couple of years, Right, there's an awful lot of thought has to go into things like this, um, right, and, how, and how you investigate things. And if you want to sort of go through qualita qualitative research, right, I'm starting to take my hat off to you, right, and I'm starting to understand how we, much easier it is with numbers. Right, I take my hat off to you. Like, I still think you're all wrong, but I'll take my hat <laughs> off to you. Right, um, a natural extension on this, um, of sort of investigating concussion is a natural extension after you've been looking at sports injuries. It's fairly straightforward in that you have the tools to do it at your disposal. Um, also, I was very fortunate in that all I had to do was like the people who I was involved with were also very keen to sort of look in this area. Um, so we've done an awful lot of this over the years. Um, what we have there. The, the guys at the top in New Zealand, um, there's a lady called Patrick Hume, a gentleman called Trevor Clark, and Doug King. He keep, he'll keep coming back all the way through this, this Doug King geezer. Right. I've done some with rugby league with a lady called Lisa Hodgson, right. and I've had two PhD students, David and Dervler, right, who have been known to me as the minions over the years. Um, it's not the easiest thing to do, concussion research. It's not, um, neuroscience has been described as the last barrier in medicine, right? So in con investigations in concussion, they're going to take an awful long time, right? The processes involved are very broad and they are subject to much debate, right? It's an area that needs to accumulate an awful lot of evidence before it's going to go somewhere, right? When it does that, it's going to be, be able to diagnose effectively and provide effective long-term treatment for an awful lot of things. But the sad fact that this is, right, the state of knowledge is at the moment, I'm afraid there's going to be an awful lot more people banged on the head before we get some proper answers. Um, it's a sad fact, that, it's a sad fact, I'm afraid. Um, moving along. Um, the research links with New Zealand are proved, have proved very, very interesting. Um, gentleman on, in the, mid, the big picture on the far side over there, the one without the gum shield in his mouth, right, is a guy called Doug King. And he asked me to be in his supervisory team for his second PhD. And, it's in, and his second PhD was going to be in sports or concussion. Right. It's something he's really passionate about because I don't know this happened to anybody else, but he actually did have, he went to attend someone at the side of a rugby pitch who actually got, was concussed and the guy died in his arms, which is fairly sad. But nonetheless, Doug's very passionate about it. Um, he is a top class researcher in the field right, and his work has had great influence. Right. He gets introduced as the dumbest bloke in the world when he stands up to speak simply because he was dumb enough to do two PhDs. Right. When I met him in October, um, he was talking about going around for a third time. So yeah, I'll give him, he's the dumbest bloke in the world. Um, also, he's, he, he does put that on the bottom of his emails, PhD squared, which I think is, you know, that's quite an accolade, the fact that you were able to do that. Um, the data he's collected, he's provided extensive validation of things like the King David concussion test, Right. He was using and published, and we published research on the X2 bio patch, which is down in this bottom corner here that's in my hand. Um, um, he was publishing on that long before Saracens first started wearing them. Right. They were out, and before they were talking about it in the news that how they might endanger players, he had research out on the subject. Um, it can be worn in one of two ways. It can either go on the gum shield, as that gentleman shown in the picture there, or you can put it behind your ear. 
All right, it's a very small piece. That is actually on all right, Catherine Blake's young son. I think he only was about five years old when it was on there. So it's a very small, unobtrusive piece of equipment which can record every knock to the head that a person takes, right, which is data that we need right, to answer this question on concussion. We need to know about the forces involved, what it takes to cause a concussion, and also a very interesting area is going to be how many, you know, what happens over, over a rugby career or a football career, right, how many impacts can you take before you start to show, you know, the wear and tear of this. Um, all right. It hasn't all been plain sailing, though, with Doug. He is, as I say, he's, there's enough about him to go around twice doing a PhD. I, let's, I don't think he's going to go around a third time, um, but he certainly investigated the possibility. He's, it's been a challenge at some point. He doesn't, like, for example, he does not mind upsetting an entire rugby union. He will quite happily do that. Right. He went on, on one occasion, he went on the radio to speak about his research. Uh, and Doug got all excited. He wanted to speak about the stuff he was doing now rather than stuff that was being public, that had already been published. And there was the medical officer of the New Zealand Rugby Union who actually got obliterated on the show. Um, so the New Zealand Rugby Union came back to sort of accuse him of using a data that was not peer reviewed, and apparently that was bad. All Doug did was get excited. It's been published now, it still stands up. Uh, and they basically came back to Patrick Hume, uh, demanding that he should be sacked as a PhD student, uh, and all his supervisors, one of whom was myself, uh, should resign immediately. So I ended up on a phone call, uh, a Skype call with this lady at three o'clock in the morning, um, and she said to me, we should sack him as a PhD student. No. We should resign immediately as supervisors? No. She said, oh, I'm glad you feel about that that way. That's the way I feel about it. The work was too important. We just tried to keep what well, we wanted to keep it going. We had to keep him as far away from the New Zealand Rugby Union as we possibly could. But he meant, nevertheless, he, he went back and he finished his work. Now, moving forward, shortly after he, he defended his PhD, I think it was about September two years ago, uh, and we, I was off somewhere and I received a text from him and the text basically said if I could take a Skype call with him in about 10 minutes time. Uh, I was on holiday with my, uh, with my wife and I was in Spain and we were in a hotel room at the time. Uh, and I texted back and said I haven't got a computer, I can't take a Skype call. So he then texted back and he said to me and he, his text said that the New Zealand Rugby Union now wanted to incorporate his research in their new concussion policy. So I text back straight away asking him if he was dreaming. Uh, he assured me that it was true and some of the procedures they wanted and they wanted to adopt things that he'd done and he'd found through his research. And now some of the stuff he does is part of their Rugby Smart project which is investigating rugby player health at the amateur level, which before everybody used to look at everything that went on at professional level because it was much easier to quantify it. But now they're looking at sort of the, the lower levels of the game. And the project is now going international and there's someone doing the work at Leeds Beckett University. I also have to give that man a special thanks. I, um, I, as I said, I met him for the first time in October. Um, but throughout all the time I've, I've ever known him, right, I've had, my PhD students have had a question, David and Dervler, he's always been there, he's just been no further than an email away that they can contact him and he will help them out whenever possible. Right. Um, when John Brewer did his inaugural address, um, he was able to speak about the marathons he's running, he's running, his triumphs and his interactions with international sports teams. Well, I haven't got any of that. Not really. Um, so I'm going to rattle on for a few minutes about some of the things I've done in sport. Um, right, 
as many of you know, I do like swimming. I do like swimming outdoors. Um, there's pictures there of a swim at Windermere, uh, and there's a picture there of the Channel Swim. That up there uh, is a colleague of mine, Anna Hewitt, who wanted to model my hoodie from the event. Um, don't know why, can't remember. Um, right, because I'm into this open water swimming, you get up early, right, and you go and train in lakes. And there was, I think, last Saturday, we managed about 23, 23 minutes at seven degrees, the water was, or something like that. But you do get some good things out of it. Um, for the people who, when I swam up at Windermere, um, the people at St Mary's on their own raised about £1,000 in sponsorship for me. Thank you to, to you all. And that was donated to the Childhood Eye Cancer Trust. Um, as far as swimming the channel goes, the greatest bit about it is that you get invited to a dinner at the end of it in Dover Town Hall. It's the next, the March after you've done it. And after dinner, they take you to this pub. They take you to this pub called the White Horse, and you get locked in. Right? It's get, it gets even better. Um, one thing the landlord does: he puts a point in one hand and he puts a marker pen in the other, and basically says, "Go and sign your name somewhere on my wall of my pub and the time it took you to swim across." Right? So you get to go in there. You get to graffiti it. If you ever go back there, you get to show people. Um, and it's incredible how, after about 27 lagers, that you're, how bad your signature is. <laughs> but there you are. It's still there. I so I did it, and I've, I've, took my, I've taken my wife back to see it. Um, I've got a colleague who swam, a guy who swam with me, one of my teammates, took his two lads to see it, and they said, and they just commented on how poor his handwriting was. But then again, he'd had 13 lagers or whatever. Um, um, I'll come back to rugby league again. Um, I coached rugby league for 20 years at various levels, right? I enjoyed it, and if I could still do it, I probably still would, right? It's given me an awful lot in life. Um, the best of which is my wife, Claire, over there, who I found at St Helens. Right, um, I've done, I've done an awful lot of it, and that is the best thing. All the research aside, standing this evening, best thing I've got. Um, this is a picture of my good friend, a guy called Chris Richards, who's, um, he, was, he, was, he was a sergeant in the Royal Marines when I coached them, and he also ended up being a captain, he, right, he captain my, the, the Royal Marines and England Lionhearts team. Um, I'm not saying he was the best player I ever coached, but it was a dream because in about six years of coaching him, that guy missed two tackles, right? Which is fairly rare, and you, every coach would love a player like that. This one, I've got to talk about this one. This is probably one of the most fun days out I've ever been on, ever, right? Those guys were Royal Marines rugby league team, and they were. In July 2000, we had, they had a, their first inaugural match between the Parachute Regiment and the Royal Marines. And it was quite something. I, and it's memorable for a lot of reasons, apart from the fact there was some rugby play. Um, it was in Aldershot, and it was in a stadium right next to the, what was then the 1st Battalion's home base. Right? And I was in there, and we were looking out, and we saw the entire battalion, a group of about 500 men marching down the road. All right, so we stood and we watched and they stopped outside the stadium and came in. That was the crowd in full combat gear, the combat uniforms. All right, um, never seen anything like that happen before. Probably never going to see it again. Um, I was standing there with my, the team manager at the time was a gentleman called Fez Wood, who's over there this evening. Good evening, Fez. Um, it was quite, he's a Falklands War veteran, so he's seen an awful lot of strange things in life. But the next thing that happened after that, after we got the team out, and the, all these women turned up with their hair dyed maroon, threatening the killers. Do you remember that one? <laughs> it was like, it was like nothing else. I'd never come across it before. Um, now, I've just I've said about how the crowd marched in the battalion, uh, the parachute regiment marched, marched the crowd in. 
Um, we can't manage anything like that on the Marine side. Every single um, commando unit was away somewhere like Bosnia or somewhere like that at the time. And all we could muster for support were about 40 very young guys who got themselves hurt in training. They all came in, uh, there were 40 of them, they were all in their teens, right, and I'd say well over half of them were on crutches. Right, and that's what we managed after the pomp and circumstance of the Royal Marie, of the, the parachute regiment coming in. This is what we could um, we could muster. In another walk of life, we'd have just called them the sick, lame, and lazy. But they were they were about to have a very good day out too. Um, the Marines won the game 36 0 It's important I tell you this this this, uh, this point in the proceedings. Um, and for most of the first half, hunter troops sat there in a stand and they really didn't know how to behave because they were all youngsters still in training. There was all these guys around them who were sort of like quite a few war veterans and things like that and people they sort of aspire to be but just not wear the same beret. Um, but so they must have sat there and are feeling some of, it, sort of fear and awe of the people around them. But as we start when the game progressed, they got they got courage, which was really good to see. All right? The more points the Marines scored, the braver they got. All right? And they took over. And winning, as John was saying, John Charlie was saying upstairs to me, uh, it is the only thing. All right? um, as we scored more points, they got braver and braver and braver. And listening to Right, trying to get the parachute regiment to join in a chorus, if you're losing 18 nil, clap your hands, about R and R in, was very, very funny. Yeah. And instead of just being youngsters who had to sit there and take it, they got to be youngsters on crutches giving it out. Um, it was quite a sight to behold. Um, and the point about all of this, it was the first one. And if you, win, if you go first and you do something first, no one ever gets to take it away from you. It's important. All right, just talking about the future, I've got a few years left before I retire. Um, as you know, I do know exactly the day I'm going to retire. <laughs> Four years, ten months. Uh, um, right, in the next four years and ten months. I, the concussion research is going to continue and the rugby injury research is going to continue. I've got links with the projects up here. Look, Ed Rugby's just coming to fruition, which is, again, working again with my old buddy, where I started, Gareth Stratton, down in, in Swansea. Um, the UK Health Project, which is the, the, the international one that started off in New Zealand, is keeping going. And there's a little organisation called the International Concussion and Head Injury Research Foundation. Um, and that's just going to about start producing some data on, on sort of retired jockey, jockeys and give us the opportunity to start looking at the long-term effects of, of, of receiving head injuries, see what effects it has, does it, does it influence dementia, stuff like that. It's on jockeys because quite simply the jockeys got organised long before anybody else and the data's been, they've been collecting data on injured jockeys for 20 years. Tw more than that, uh, and they've also got stuff about, and they know where they all are now, so they can track them long term. Um, I also get to write uh, a regu regular, regularly on sort of on about statistics, right, and the education involved in it, and the statistics understanding. Something that keeps me very, very happy. Uh, but some time ago, as was alluded to earlier by Francis, I became the academic director. Um, so it's not all going to be about my research, it's about getting other people to do research. Um, they haven't yet, these people haven't decided, some of them haven't decided they want to or they're going to be dragged. But it is about me doing it, other, helping other people out. It's going to be an ongoing process. Uh, and it's something we've got to continue, continually strive to do better and better on. Right? I think for a school of our size, and this is a conversation I had with Jamie the other day, I think we do very well and we produce some good research. Um, the more we produce, right, the better we, I, I think the better our situation is going to be. 
And that behind me is a list of everybody in our school who's got a PhD. And very soon, others are going to join them. Right? We need to make the most of what we've got. Right? And we're in a situation now where we've got um, all the PhD students we've got are, I think, are a thoroughly good bunch of people, and I do admire their work attitude. Um, when we got them and they're producing meta-analysis and systematic reviews for high-ranking journals, I think we've got a very good basis to begin with. Uh, we've now got something, and this is ongoing conversations I'm having at various places around the university. Right, we've got some research modules in the MRes, right, and I'm trying to negotiate with other parts of the university to get the taught modules. And what I'd like them to be is we could have a research certificate that's at the same standing as a teaching certificate is in this place. Right. I think they're vital skills. I think they're very important because if you think about if you're going to lead a professional life 10 years down the road, what you're actually taught in the university you don't use very much of. But the research skills you will need to equip yourself to educate yourself in the future. So I think that's really important. Um, uh, also on top of this, it's not a bad idea. If you have people doing courses, right, people who know how to sort of run systematic reviews and meta-analysis and things like randomised clinical trials and they've had like eight, ten hours of tuition on them, you know, they can do it, you know, they can help us out in a lot of different ways. So I think they're very worthwhile having. Um, we are building up our external collaborations, um, some recent ones, Fulham Football Club, London Irish, right and the Royal Ballet. Right, and our research does very well in such certain areas such as skill acquisition, occlusion training and nutrigenomics. Right, we do excel in those areas. Right, in short, I think what we've got is we've got the raw materials to push on and do very well with this. Right, in our particular school. And there are um, negotiations and discussions going on about the background, about extending our, uh, our sort of provision for PhDs and stuff like that. But I think it's very important, and I, right, and I am one of these people, I will always be going on about how important research is, not just producing it. Right? We, have to, we have to get our, our graduates who, right, if they go out and they never research at all, they're still going to be consumers of the research. They've got to know how to interpret it to do their practice the best it can be done. Um, I get to stand here tonight, and I wouldn't have got here right, without an awful lot, of people along, awful lot of people along the way. I mentioned a lot as I was going along. Right, that I've gone, gone and I've worked through over the years, but there are others who I haven't included in the presentation. Um, I haven't got a list of their names here in front of me, but I need to thank them as well. Right? I need to thank sort of lots of different people. Right? Most of all, if you're doing injury research, right, you set the whole thing up and you run this really big risk of having no data. If nobody gets hurt, you haven't got anything. Right? It's something you've got to prepare yourself for. Um, it hasn't happened yet. Um, so, I've got to say thank you. Without all these people I've come across over the years who are brave enough to put their bodies on the line, right, I would have had nothing whatsoever to write about ever. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. <laughs>